I'm Mary Lloyd Ireland from the University of Kentucky. This presentation is on medial and lateral meniscus tear patterns and newer ways to repair the menisci, including root repair. Smith Nephew has been a pioneer uh, in developing ways that we can do root repairs with lower profile suture passing devices and um, ways to uh, use tibial aimers that they've developed. Also by acquiring the Soterix Orthopedics, they have a Nova stitch that will allow us to do improved radial tears, doing inside out with the fast fix, and also understanding that we need to have hybrids where we do outside in, inside out, all inside, and transtibial. You have to have an appreciation of these root tears look at them and fix them if you can. I am a speaker consultant with Smith Nephew. ACL and meniscal tear cases, a panel. We ran out of time at the fellows course, so I wanted to get this to everyone and post it on the Smith Nephew website. I was honored to be asked to attend and participate in the wider scope of arthroscopy fellows course held in Chicago and hosted by Smith Nephew. I thank them for their continued dedication to education for all of us throughout a lifespan. I have been a paid consultant as a speaker for Smith Nephew. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland and I practice at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. The panelists for our case were Dr. Walter Shelton of Jackson, Mississippi, and Dr. Johnson of the University of Kentucky ended up being the other panelists. You can see that this is a lifelong education. The lower pictures are from the ACL study group and show Freddie Fu and Volker Mushal uh, in Cape Town watching Dr. Fagan talk about the Waggle test. We are lifelong educators and educatees. Jeffrey Van Thiel was also involved in the dissection in this part of the course. This is a right knee. Fortunately, there have been advances in the ways and the instruments that we can use to repair roots. We're appreciating more and more root tears, and fortunately now we have ways to fix them. This is a right knee. You can see the differences in the shapes of the menisci, more C-shape of the medial meniscus and U-shape of the lateral meniscus. The medial side is more affixed to the capsule. So we must appreciate these root tears preoperatively by our MRI scans, but also look at the posterior roots and assess them critically at the time of arthroscopy. Lateral, you have the ligaments of Humphrey and Risberg. From the posterior view, if you lose your root, then you can have a progression of uh, tear to make it be a bucket handle or have to have a um, meniscectomy done, which in our young athletes, particularly with an ACL acute injury, we want to repair the menisci. Isolated medial meniscal root tear Coronal oblique views that our musculoskeletal radiologists at the University of Kentucky routinely do are very helpful. This view isn't one that most radiologists um, uh, have, so this is one that I would encourage you to make sure you can get this view. Justin Montgomery, our uh, radiologist, would be happy to talk to you about this. And the arrow here shows the root attachment of the medial meniscus. You can see the PCL to the left, the arrows pointing at that root attachment. And this is the coronal oblique tear on a T1 image. Another view of the coronal oblique T1 root tears. So it's an avulsion from the attachment into the posterior aspect or the root of the meniscus. So get this view and show this to your radiologists. So you'll be prepared to do a root repair. This is a 15-year-old soccer player, had a non-contact pivoting right knee injury. 
past history is significant in that previously, eight, nine months ago, she had had a tibial spine avulsion repair. Then you can see the um, suspension fixation on the tibia from the repair. This is her MRI scan. You can see she has a hemarthrosis. And if you look at the lower left, you can see that root of the medial meniscus. Looks a little different than the lateral meniscus root. That view is probably the better one. Uh, you can also see these axial cuts where when you look to the posterior aspect in here, you'll see there isn't a good definition of the meniscus tissue back to the posterior capsule. But the lower left shows that better uh, than any. And then over here, the lateral uh, meniscus attachment root is normal. And see how there's a gap there where there's fluid. So this gave us a clue based on the radiologist reading that there uh, was indeed a medial meniscus root tear. And you don't see it as well here on these coronals or certainly on the lateral view. You can see by where it's highlighted with the arrows. Now here's our coronal oblique view in that lower right-hand side, and you can see clearly where that tear is by the uh, arrow in the lower right. Again, the capsule uh, looks a little uh, blown out here, and then you can see here on the coronal where there's this separation. So it gives us clue that there is indeed a medial meniscal root tear. And if you look on this sagittal section, see how the meniscus is high riding there? So those are all clues that we will be able to repair the root. We've got to see it first, though. This is the arthroscopic view of this. The lower right-hand side shows where that root tear is. And this can be fixed uh, best if we use tibial tunnels and put that root back down to the tibia. You can see where the probe disappears in that uh, posterior third medial meniscus tear, but definitely a root tear. After appreciating the root tear, the next step is to do the repair. So you can see the probe in the upper left is demonstrating that root tear. The low profile first pass is in the upper right and we're passing the, the braided suture. So you can use ultra cord or ultra suture. And this is probably a better way to do it with the actual tape. So the tape doesn't tend to cut through and will give you a better fixation back down to the tibia. So in principle, what we're doing is putting the root tear back where it should be, which is attaching to the tibia. Other devices that have been used are fast fix where we push actually the, the meniscus out to the capsule. But anatomically, it's going to be much better if we can get a better fixation down to the tibia where that root belongs. So then we pass this through uh, drill holes, one or two tibial drill holes. And the Smith Nephew company has come up with uh, excellent devices um, developed in uh, coordination with Rob LaProd to do root repairs. It's a tight space back there. You should practice this in the lab, but root repairs are here to stay, and this is a very good way to do it over drill holes in the bone with the ultra tape. This is a 17-year-old uh, wrestler who had a left knee injury. Um, there was a medial meniscus posterior root tear, um, and this cannot be quite as well seen here, but if you look here, we see a posterior third. It's not as much an avulsion of the root as it is a capsular tear, so we don't have it torn from the tibial attachment, but more from the capsule. So this is a little different uh, tear pattern, um, and in this case, uh, repair was done with the uh, previous generations of fast fix. So here is the vertical tear of the posterior half of the medial meniscus, and the difference in this is the root is actually connected. So you can see here as we go back into the posterior capsule, the PCL is on the right. You can see where we're demonstrating this, but the root is actually intact. So this is more of a capsular injury or a peripheral tear of the medial meniscus and not a classic only root tear. This would be a ramp lesion. 
How do we repair this? Well, you can see the root is intact, and if we can get sutures to be balanced on the femoral and tibial side, that's better. Oftentimes, it's difficult to get it on the femoral side. This is the first generation of the fast fix. Other generations also are available, and we just need to make sure that we don't cause articular cartilage injury to this. So this is a single sliding knot, and I'm pulling that down, and um, a very balanced repair occurred in this situation where I was able to balance it on the femoral and the tibial side. You notice here this is a horizontal suture. You can do vertical or horizontal. Uh, the best fixation um, biomechanically would be vertical-oriented uh, sutures. Sometimes I do, um, mat do a uh, mattress horizontal, and if the tissue is better for that, I'll do that instead of the um, vertical that you can see on the femoral side. So again, the roots uh, intact, as you can see here, but this is a peripheral capsular uh, injury or a ramp lesion. You don't want to miss these. So this would be a, a time to um, talk about questions, talk about uh, different ways that these menisci can be repaired. And again, much different root repair. You want to go back to the tibia and secure that um, uh, very solidly, probably with ultra uh, tape, as opposed to the peripheral capsular lesions. Uh, red white or red red where you want to put those back more toward the capsule pushing the meniscus toward the capsule other techniques that can be done is a posterior medial portal and you push the capsule through to the uh, posterior aspect of the medial meniscus Philippe Noret of Lyon France has popularized this technique so be prepared don't miss root tears particularly the medial root Now we'll shift to lateral root tears. We see these more commonly with ACL tears. The risk factors associated with grade three pivot shift. 90% of patients with a grade three shift had two or more of the below risk factors. Lateral meniscus root tear, bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus, increased lateral tibial slope, or injury to the ALC. So beware of unstable lateral meniscus tears in the higher grade pivots. What does it take to have a high grade pivot shift? This consensus again was lateral meniscus radial tears, root tears, or bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus. So the lateral meniscus is a very important stabilizer of that more hypermobile lateral compartment. And this shows different tear patterns of the root tear on the left. Um, the lateral meniscus in the center is kind of high riding. It's up off of the tibia, which is a clue that that needs to be repaired as well. And then this is the bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus that um, in past years we maybe would not have tried to repair. But now with the newer techniques, we want to repair this and consider augmenting it with uh, blood. Uh, so you're going to have uh, your own stem cell intraarticularly with an ACL, so you will have done your notchplasty or your microfracture of the notch, so you'll have your stem cells there. How do we repair lateral meniscal radial tear? So this is a flap tear or radial tear. Again, in the past, we did not repair these, but now we're saving the meniscus at all costs, and there's no harm in trying to repair this. So this is a radial tear of a posterior base flap tear of the lateral meniscus, and uh, this is probing it, and we'll want to put sutures in it. Uh, and in this case, we would do side-to-side -side or oblique sutures in this. Post-op rehab is a little bit different when there can be some protected um, weight-bearing, less weight-bearing initially, and limitations of flexion. Root repair instruments. These are very important. You need to be prepared. You need to have a jig to drill your tibial side if you're going to do a root repair. And then you also have to have uh, cannulas, uh, curved rasp, curved shaver to be able to get back into that posterior compartment. The lateral side is going to be a little easier than the medial side to see. And then have your sutures, whether you use 2 PDS, ultra cord, or ultra braid. Uh, suture, have these available particularly uh, with an ACL and a young person. 
These low profile curved tibial aimers allow us to get back in the back and get to where that attachment should be. Uh, this is um, the example of these low profile curved tibial aimers. The hidden reality is lateral meniscal root tears. You may not have seen it, but it has seen you many times. And fortunately, now we have the instrumentation and the appreciation of these root tears by understanding a uh, high-grade pivot, looking at your coronal oblique MRI scans, that these tears do exist. This is what the normal attachment of the lateral meniscal root is, and this is what that attachment is with a root tear, and you can see how superior that lateral meniscus is. So this is one that you want to fix. This is what the normal, so we have to understand what normal is. There's more mobility of the lateral meniscus naturally, but this is normal on the left, and then this is the high riding um, lateral uh, meniscal root tear. These um, slides are courtesy of Charlie Brown, who has done some great uh, work in um, uh, classifying um, lateral meniscus tears, developing techniques to repair them, and um, giving us an appreciation of how important the lateral meniscus root tear is in association with a grade three pivot shift. And this is an example of the uh, braid, the tape to do the repair. And again, this doesn't cut through like sutures would cut through. And this uh, tape, this ultra tape, is again a good advance to do and pass that through a single or double tibial um, tunnel and tie it over a button or over a bone. So you can see now where that repair is stable and we've sucked it back down to the bone, which anatomically is where it needed to be, not pushed toward the capsule as with a fast fix, all inside fixation. Probably the worst tear of all is that radial tear of the lateral meniscus that propagates all the way to the capsule, as you can see up here on the upper left. So you really need to do like a shoelace technique uh, to repair these. Uh, there are other uh, acquisitions that Smith's nephew has had, the Soterix company. There are better ways to do these um, radial white, white tears. But you can see here with the orientation of this, uh, we can do obliques. We can do uh, a shoelace type thing, but you have to get this part to the other part. And this would definitely be one we would keep non-weight bearing, because if you think about the femoral condyles, going to come down and split that where the posterior part goes one way and anterior part goes another way. These tears can be successful at a high rate if you do a repair like this, courtesy of Charlie Brown's case. And repair it in this way. So uh, all um, you, know, you have to do inside out, uh, other, um, uh, other ways with the Soterix, and uh, again, know what instrumentation you have and how to use it. Practice this in the lab or the OLC and go to labs. And if you do have a tear pattern that's a radial tear of the lateral meniscus, you really want to fix that because taking that out is going to be a subtotal lateral meniscectomy. So here's the way that he fixed this um, and you can do all inside, inside out, uh, and this depicts a, an inside out approach uh, and uh, make sure you avoid the perineal nerve, uh, put the knee in flexion, uh, do an open approach, and use uh, some type of a vaginal speculum or a spoon to protect those posterior structures, particularly the perineal nerve, and do this in flexion or a figure of four position. Thank you, Charlie, for that and for popularizing repairing the menisci in so many different ways. The true gold standard of meniscus repair was an inside-out repair techniques. So in addition to these newer ways to repair the meniscus, either through the tibia down to bone or the all inside, we also have to have an understanding and a knowledge to do the outside inside out meniscal repair techniques, particularly in the anterior horn. We can also do inside out techniques, uh, but we need that equipment available. The gold standard for meniscus repair is inside out. However, you can do a hybrid, a combination. So in the back, you can do through the tibia or all inside, and in the front, either use the newer uh, devices of the Soterix or uh, use um, uh, inside out. Uh, what about uh, other things such as blood clot, stem cell? With the ACL, we have that available um, naturally, so to speak. Um, this is a repair technique. Again, the hoop stresses are restored in this way. 
a lot of sutures, but it's only suture, no devices, so this would not be as inexpensive as some of the all inside techniques. Uh, and this is the inside out technique uh, with the different zone specific cannulas so we can get the sutures, uh, the needles in more anterior to avoid the neurovascular structures of the infratelar branches of the saphenous nerve medially or perineal nerve laterally. Fibrin clot, uh, this uh, does improve the uh, healing rate. So in an isolated meniscus uh, repair, you might consider this. Use the patient's own blood cheap and expensive it's there anesthesia service with the right kit then you can make this fibrin clot and put that in some people sew it in but secure it so it is at that um, repair site to improve the healing rate of the meniscus repair again this is courtesy of charlie brown so in conclusion at all cost save the meniscus save the whale campaign Always no exceptions. Watch out, you can always get tripped up by your fellow fellow or fellow partners. And if you can, repair the meniscus, be prepared. Practice in the lab and make sure you have the equipment that you need. Any questions? Reflect and uh, get your uh, attendings or those in your conference different ways that they've done meniscus repairs over the year and what they feel about the newer techniques and advances in instrumentation. Now's the time to share some of these cases, research it, and figure out what you're gonna do when you're in practice. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes, Oscar Wilde. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Remember some of these quotes and uh, understand that you will have complications, there will be challenging times, but be humble and be kind and take care of your patients the way you want to be taken care of. Thank you very much, Water Buck in Africa. Please uh, go to my website. This will be on the website as will other presentations. And if you would like to reach out to me, contact me, I would be happy to help you in any way. This case is a football contact injury, left knee, acute medial collateral ligament and anterior cruciate ligament tears. We'll talk about the exam, the MRI scan, and treatment. This was presented at the Fellows course, the wider scope of arthroscopy, hosted by Smith Nephew at the Orthopedic Learning Center in Chicago. I am thankful to be a paid consultant as a speaker of Smith Nephew and appreciate their support of education in orthopedics and sports medicine. I'm Mary Lloyd Ireland. This is a 16-year-old football athlete, contact injury to the left knee, complained of calf pain more than knee pain. This is an important point of if you have somebody with calf pain, a 16-year-old isn't going to have a DVT, so get an x-ray. So he was hit from the lateral aspect and had a non-displaced fibula fracture. Posterior lateral corner was normal, so uh, he had a fibula fracture, and that's why he had calf pain. Make the diagnosis so you don't have any issues with that. We didn't have to treat that in any way. But he did have an ACL-MCL injury. This is his MRI of his um, knee. You can see here the MCL appears to be attached proximally, but the waviness that you see in the MCL, this is the superficial medial collateral ligament, so obviously that is completely avulsed distally, and this meniscus is high riding, right? So the meniscus is unstable, and this is a more of a capsular injury where the meniscus needs to be put back down here and a complete superficial medial collateral ligament injury. You can see where the meniscus is extruded. Lateral meniscus looks good. This is his exam under anesthesia. Uh, left knee is the involved knee. You can see how at 30 degrees he opens up, consistent with his medial or anteral medial rotatory instability. His ACL is also torn. Um, if the MCL tears proximally, that has a better chance of healing. Uh, so three plus opening on valgus stress testing. Your pivot shift is not gonna be as significant because there's no medial stability to pivot around. Here's his examiner anesthesia with his 
anterior drawer. Uh, do it in neutral, internal, external rotation. If you have a medial injury, your be greater anterior tibial translation as his was, three plus in external rotation, two plus in neutral. And again, your pivot shift, which I like to perform this way with axial loading, internal rotation of the tibia is not as significant uh, because he has no medial stability. So there's nothing to rotate around, so to speak. ACL, uh, distal, MCL, deep capsular injury, anterior drawer, and new internal rotation. See how it tightens up in internal rotation. And again, a bird's eye view of your pivot. Not going to be as great because you have no medial post or medial stability to rotate around. So um, ACL is completely torn. Stable in extension, three plus opening in uh, valgus testing. So he has acute anterior medial and anterior lateral rotatory instability. Both need to be addressed, particularly with a distal injury to his MCL. Uh, synovial fluid will bathe out uh, that uh, and keep it from healing, and he would end up with a chronic anterior medial instability. This is his surgical um, arthroscopic uh, video. So you can see where the meniscus, as billed by the MRI scan, is high riding. There is injury to the uh, deep meniscotibial um, ligamentous structures. This is uh, a case before we had our root repair techniques. So I'm doing an all inside through generation one of Smith Nephew. You can see the plastic anchors and the pledgets now are made out of different materials. If I had root repairs available, I would have done this in this case, because you can see how far that the meniscus is from its attachment back to the tibia. This patient ended up doing very well, so I'm connecting that um, super aspect of the meniscus back to the capsule. Anatomically, again, better to have done it back here, but this did work. So I am doing an inside, all inside repair on the femoral side. His deep capsular ligament, tibio um, meniscal ligament, needs to be addressed as well as the superficial tibial collateral. So I've gotten it a little closer to the tibia. And you can see this is that deep capsular injury that you can see arthroscopically. This is my uh, ACL. Uh, so I do the medial meniscus uh, all inside repair first, um, then ream my tunnels and do the open MCL repair. Uh, I will ream, uh, actually ream inside out here. Uh, a outside in can be done through a pin or over a guide wire. Um, and then this is our uh, reaming, um, which I like using this uh, acorn reamer with a smaller shaft. Uh, and then um, fix this with an interference screw. This is a bone patellar tendon bone. Um, and then uh, the ACL graft is intact. I'll wait to tie that down until I do my medial repair, making sure that I have my femoral side is well attached. Uh, and then I'll go back in and do an inside out to localize the best spot for our uh, incision. Uh, again, deep capsular total uh, injury here, uh, good view through the, um, uh, through the knee, and you can see the superficial tibial collateral ligament right there that is also avulsed distally. And the meniscus is still high riding. I'm going to pull that back down and do an open repair of the superficial and deep tibial collateral ligament and get the meniscus back in an anatomic position. This inside out, and these are two OPDS sutures. The inside out techniques allow you to uh, better make your incision where you know the pathology is. So I'm doing an outside uh, uh, in with a needle to localize uh, where I want my incision to be. You can make a larger or a smaller incision, uh, and you can see the needle there. So here's my incision medially. Can perhaps make a little um, more accurate uh, position and a little less uh, large um, incision. And there's your superficial tibial collateral ligament right there. And this is the deep capsular ligament, meniscotibial ligament right here. See my sutures, which I put in all inside. And then there's your superficial tibial collateral ligament. And then there's the capsule. So I'll do a pants over vest repair of that with big bicral sutures, tie the menisci, menisci down, 
and then fix the superficial tibial collateral ligament with a uh, suture anchor. Oftentimes use uh, labral anchors from the shoulder to do that with um, uh, a couple of loaded sutures on there. So you can see your injury. Sometimes it can be a little hard to define where it is open, so it is nice to um, figure that out arthroscopic and do your direct repair. And he did great, moved him early, non-weight bearing for about four weeks to protect your medial uh, collateral ligament repair and your meniscus repair. With advances in arthroscopy, we do fewer and fewer open techniques. So you have to know your anatomy, know that posterior medial corner. The medial collateral ligament uh, is comprised of the superficial and deep. So where he avulsed his ligament superficially was distal, and that led to a high-riding meniscus because he also avulsed his deep collateral ligament menisco tibial side so here's our distal and then the deep um, was seen in the arthroscopic picture posterior oblique ligament runs posterior to the superficial medial collateral ligament you can see here where the pol is so this is the posterior oblique ligament this will need to be repaired or reefed it is if it is torn and there are multiple bands attaching to the posterior medial capsule, semimembranosus, and proximal tibia that comprise the uh, posterior oblique ligament. Adductor tubercle is the key to uh, MPFL repairs, identifying that. And then here's the semimembranosus with its five attachments proximal in the medial aspect of the uh, tibia. So you have to know your anatomy, uh, review it, um, and you sometimes have to do more of an open approach than you might be used to doing arthroscopic techniques. Do dissection, review the anatomy. Know your open anatomy. Us arthroscopists need to um, challenge each other to know the open anatomy by teaching in the lab and doing uh, more cadaver dissections and work with our younger uh, fellows and residents. The ACL does not work alone, so if we only did an ACL repair in that patient, the ACL would have too much stress and would definitely fail, and then you would end up with a chronic medial instability and a vision ACL. Us orthopedic surgeons can restore stability of the knee, but not necessarily this normal mosaic or the homeostasis to the knee, as Scott Dye has taught us about. So. Um, make sure that you communicate that with your patients. Don't let them go back too quickly and counsel them on modification of activities so they don't too, put too many pack years on their operated knee. So as the Beatles uh, said, to get by with a little help of my friends, help from my friends, so we need to repair the MCL or other ligaments if we have associated ligamentous uh, injury, and it's best to do that acute as opposed to chronically. ACL does not work alone. Questions? Now's the time to review the case, see what different management would have been done. Any questions? Reflect and uh, get your uh, attendings or those in your conference and what they feel about the newer techniques and advances in instrumentation. Now's the time to share some of these cases, research it, and figure out what you're going to do when you're in practice. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes, Oscar Wilde. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Remember some of these quotes and uh, understand that you will have complications, there will be challenging times, but be humble and be kind and take care of your patients the way you want to be taken care of. Thank you very much, Water Buck in Africa. Please uh, go to my website. This will be on the website, as will other presentations. And if you would like to reach out to me, contact me, I would be happy to help you in any way. Revision ACL cases in consideration of when to do extraarticular procedures. I will present one of my own failures, which I thought the graft was in the right place. We have to think about why an ACL reconstruction repair failed, reconstruction failed. Was it surgeon error, patient going back too quickly, graft choice, higher risk factors in the individual such as recurbotum, bony, and others. 
So when you do a revision, now we have to decide whether to do an extraarticular procedure and what procedure to do. So we'll review those procedures. And you must look in the literature from 30 years ago, a generation ago, we did a lot of extraarticular reconstructions prior to our ability to do arthroscopically aided ACL reconstructions and put it back in an anatomic spot. I'm Mary Lloyd Ireland, a 17-year-old University of Kentucky freshman. He was playing pickup basketball, landed awkwardly. Three months prior to my seeing him, and he underwent a bone patellar tendon bone autograph and medial meniscus repair. I saw him one time post-op, and he came back about five months post-op, stating that he slipped on the ice. He had been seen playing basketball, but he retore his ACL and medial meniscus, unsure exactly when, probably a month after his ACL reconstruction, when he returned to basketball too quickly. It's very important in this high-risk age group who will go do activities that we, the surgeons, don't approve of to try to see them back and counsel them on how important it is to follow the first six-month post-op restrictions uh, based on their findings so they don't re-tear their ACL. So here we have a 17-year-old freshman who's already had one ACL reconstruction his first semester, and then his second semester needs to have a second one. He's not doing very well in school, by the way. Here are my first radiographs. It's always good to critique the radiographs to see is there, are the tunnels in the right place. As I critique these, it looks like we're very well posterior. You can see the tunnel here. My plug from his autograph is well posterior, so I'd say that's a couple of millimeters. However, we can't totally know the position of the graft on plain films. We'd need a CT scan or an MRI to better tell that for sure. Um, the screws are well paralleling the plugs. You can see where I don't bone graft the tibia, I did bone graft the patella, and um, I like using the, say, the 2 o'clock, 10 o'clock position is where I like to put the graft, not too low, but you want to be posterior and in the anatomic right spot, get that target, get that collagen in the right spot, and a single bundle technique has been what I've done. So that first post-op visit, I thought it looked pretty good. Saw him five months later, and this is his actual revision ACL allograft. I used the bone patellar tendon allograft, and you can see here where I was able to do this in one stage. I ended up using uh, Smith Nephew Bio RCI screws. So here's his uh, plug, uh, the two plugs. So uh, I got good uh, fill of the tunnels. Tunnels did not have uh, any significant osteolysis to them, probably because of um, using the metal uh, screws and also having bone in the tunnels. Uh, so here's his um, uh, lateral view, uh, and this is his post-op view of his second ACL reconstruction where I used an allograft on him, bone patellar tendon bone. This is um, his arthroscopic picture. You can see where he has some synovialization of the graft, but it is clearly torn, nothing attached up to the femur. Sometimes it can be difficult to getting the, the femoral screw out, but usually there's good bone around it. So using the osteotome around the screw and then uh, pushing the, putting the screw uh, clockwise, then counterclockwise, uh, make sure the screw head is seated. Uh, and then I like using the Schlesinger cl clamp to remove this. And so now we're faced with a uh, tunnel that is in the right place. So we're going to have to use that same tunnel. We have to make a decision of whether we go over the top. Do we do an outside-in guide? Do we go through the same tunnel? So this is now um, five months after his previous ACL reconstruction. And I elected to um, that my spot, my femoral tunnel, was in a good position wanted to change the, the um, uh, position of it from the standpoint of the exiting so that we didn't get into bone that I could not secure the graft with. So I did use uh, the pinpoint developed by Dr. Uh, Darren Johnson, an outside-in guide, and did an IT band uh, cut. I didn't go through the, uh, the cortex laterally, and this is my fixation with the bio-RCI on the uh, femur. 
Um, very happy with the uh, allograft, unhappy that he failed the first um, autograft. Um, and then here's our finished um, ACL reconstruction of his left knee. The unfortunate thing was his meniscus tear. You can see here where the meniscus is totally beat up. He had a um, repair previously. You can see the fast fix back there on that tibial side. So when I've done revisions, it seems like the meniscus tissue is what fails. It's not necessarily our fixation, but those sutures uh, cut through the bad tissue. So unfortunately, ended up with a 50% uh, partial medial meniscectomy that in a 17-year-old um, is not the best thing. So, and you can see where uh, even though he's only five months after his first ACL reconstruction, he's already got some articular cartilage injury of grade 2 chondromalacia. Bad situation for him, so he should be followed with uh, counseling on his activity level, his amount of axial loading, amount of basketball play, and followed up with yearly x-rays as long as we can uh, find him. I haven't seen him back. And this is an example of removing those uh, fast-fix uh, devices. Fortunately, they're small enough where they don't cause articular cartilage wear, but you can just see where this meniscus is, uh, uh, is a complex tear, tibial side unstable, uh, that I had to do a partial meniscectomy. No way that this could be repaired. Just comments about revision ACL reconstruction. Femoral hardware removal can be tough. This is a right revision. Uh, so using your osteotome and making sure you get that um, relatively hard cancellous bone out first is good. Go forward, put your uh, uh, screwdriver in all the way, seat it all the way so you don't strip it. Go forward and then go backward. That seems like a, a way that I've been able to do uh, the hardware removal in the simplest way. Sometimes the hardware removal is a harder situation than you expect can be harder than the actual uh, case. And then you can see that sclerotic bone around that femoral screw. In this case, I was able to go more posterior with the revision uh, and pass the graft up. And um, in this case, use the metal screw. Uh, the bio-RCI screws are nice because you, they go in one millimeter increments in diameter, whereas the um, metal ones go in two. So the ACL revision, uh, successful. Particularly in revision cases, it's very important for the surgeon who performs the ACL reconstruction has to drive the return to play train. You don't want to have to do a third revision. So oftentimes it's the parents of the young athletes that have to get back at a certain time, uh, whether it's scholarship or missing out on a whole season, and it's much better for them to be totally prepared and after a revision it could be up to a year before they return to that sport and consideration of other sports or less risky sports should be a discussion that you have with the parents, the young athletes, and the coaches. Usually the trainers and the physicians are on the same page. It's the parents in particular that need to understand what the potential problems are with this if there's another failure, potential arthritis or uh, really changing um, in the patient's fear of re-injury, depression, other psychologic, emotional issues that they may have. So we need to be the protector of these young athletes um, in some ways, but stick to our guns and don't let these um, athletes, particularly after revision, go back to their sport too quickly. We do the surgery and we should drive the return to play train as well. This is a good time to ask questions, uh, discuss the cases, discuss revisions, what pearls uh, the attendings or others may have, what cases they've shared, even talk about um, some of the things you remember about hard revisions. You usually want to put the revision surgery on at the end of the day because you never know how long it's going to take. Be prepared with C-arm if you need it, difficulty in getting hardware out, make sure you know what hardware was put in so you can have the correct extraction instruments. Be prepared. Any questions? Reflect and uh, get your uh, attendings or those in your conference and what they feel about the newer techniques and advances in instrumentation. Now's the time to share some of these cases, research it, and figure out what you're going to do when you're in practice. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes. 
Oscar Wilde. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Remember some of these quotes and uh, understand that you will have complications, there will be challenging times, but be humble and be kind and take care of your patients the way you want to be taken care of. Thank you very much, Water Buck in Africa. Please uh, go to my website. This will be on the website as will other presentations. And if you would like to reach out to me, contact me, I would be happy to help you in any way. The next topic I wanted to bring up is extraarticular ACL reconstructions. When I did my fellowship with Dr. Andrews in the mid 80s, we did his mini reconstruction or the Andrews reconstruction. And this was dividing the IT band and anteriorizing the IT band. We did this exclusively, and although the patients ended up with a 10 degree flexion contracture, they were stable from the standpoint of they had no pivot shift. So this was what our instrumentation would let us do in the 80s because we did not have arthroscopic instruments as the advances um, now are unbelievable. And you younger fellows should take advantage of all of uh, these advances, practice in the lab, and um, make sure you understand the techniques and what's available. So now with that high risk ACL injury, one that has a re-tear, we're going back to anterolateral reconstructions, extraarticular reconstructions as a backup to the ACL. So Dr. Alan Getgood and Charlie Brown did a um, panel consensus group meeting of the anterolateral complex of the knee, discussing the anatomy of this and how we need to address that higher risk pivot shift or the higher risk re-injury to the ACL, who needs to have an extraarticular backup or an extraarticular reconstruction. So now 30 years later, we're back to uh, extraarticular reconstructions and whether we should do a backup. One of the concerns when we started doing all intraarticular anatomic ACL reconstructions was that the extraarticular would stress shield that ACL and make that not uh, work. So uh, we're now a generation later back to uh, using this as a backup. So I would uh, suggest that you look at the literature from 30 years ago, see what techniques were used, uh, and develop what technique works best in your hand if you need to do an extraarticular reconstruction. The modified Lemire tenodesis has been the popular one um, in this um, uh, revamping um, of uh, extraarticular reconstructions, um, and this is what is being done. Uh, Smith Nephew, again, has been um, a um, pioneer in um, using the Biobsorb Regenisorb uh, BioSure uh, interference screw fixation, uh, and there are technique guides. These were the participants in uh, this um, uh, expert panel, and uh, I would suggest that you look at this and see what conclusions that they came up with. Um, and the special guests of Werner Mueller, John Carlson, and Braden Fleming um, uh, added uh, uh, much basic science and, and history. Uh, Werner Mueller's book, The Knee, is a uh, classic, and I would suggest that you review that and know the biomechanics and anatomy that Dr. Mueller um, has um, uh, educated us on throughout his um, lifetime. The consensus position statement, clinical evidence is currently lacking to support clear indications for lateral extraarticular procedures as an augmentation to ACL reconstruction. Appropriate indications may include revision ACL, patients with a high-grade pivot shift, generalized ligamentous laxity, genu recurvatum, young patients returning to pivoting activities. So this is truly an indications work in progress, and I think you'll see more and more about this. So you do need to have this extraarticular uh, reconstruction technique in your armamentarium. Review the literature, look at the European literature. So this is the um, extraarticular technique as popularized uh, by Alan Getgood and Charlie Brown. Uh, and if you look at the upper uh, right, this is the lateral aspect of a right knee. So here's your incision, fibular head is here, IT band. So basically the IT band is 
detached proximally, brought underneath the lateral collateral ligament. Um, the lateral uh, femoral condyle is roughened up, uh, and then fixation is done there. Uh, so this is a saw roughening up the bone. So you put back with a staple or the, the, uh, the screw as shown here. And then if there's enough IT band left, you can suture that back through. So this is a proximal detachment. Go deep to the fibular collateral ligament and turn it back on itself. There are a lot of other techniques that have been done, like I said, 30 years ago. Uh, and these are some of those other techniques, IT band tenodices. This is the Andrews. So this was uh, a cross stitch where basically we would cut the IT band, elevate it anteriorly, and pass it through two drill holes, tying this over bone. So this is the suturing that we would use, uh, number five Tychron suture. Uh, and this did work very well. Again, the patients had a bit of a flexion contracture, but it eliminated their pivot shift. So this is another consideration of what type of IT band tenodesis to do. Uh, this was very easy to do, no uh, extra equipment, just used a beef needle and sutured those, tied those down over, uh, over a uh, bone um, bridge uh, medially. Um, there are different um, development of the femur where there are different cams. If you have a, a accentuated cam with more concavity where the uh, lateral aspect of the femur to the diaphysis is, that's going to work a little bit better because that cinches up around that cam effect. If it's flatter, that may not be the best procedure. And then here is the Lemire procedure where uh, it's transected proximally. The Ellingson was a distal um, uh, detachment and then put it back again through the fibular collateral ligament. Macintosh, both extra and intraarticular uh, reconstruction was done with the IT band. Again, this was described uh, 40 years ago and was an over-the-top intraarticular uh, detach the uh, IT band proximally and then pass that underneath the fibular collateral ligament and then back on itself uh, and then suture it or through a drill hole back on the tibia know the history of taking care of this and the IT band TINA DC techniques. What are your indications for extraarticular tenodesis? Preferred procedure? This is something for you to talk about amongst yourselves. Look at the literature. Uh, I think there will be more information through Alan Getgood's study of who needs to have it done. During my fellowship, we did two open ACL reconstructions and too numerous to count Andrew's mini reconstructions. So really had that down. Uh, but then when I got into practice in 1985, um, we changed everything. Uh, and we now did few extra articulars and all arthroscopically aided. So fellows need to be ready for a change in surgical techniques. You know what doesn't change? How to take care of patients, history and physical exam skills. And I would encourage you to go to clinic with your attendings, with your mentors, see how they take care of patients. And that's an art that you really need to have and you'll have that for your rest of your life what is gonna change are the surgical techniques. And that's where we have to keep up with companies like Smith Nephew going to the Orthopedic uh, Learning Center and other uh, local places that we can practice on the new devices that are uh, invented for us. We're very lucky to have such support of uh, companies such as Smith Nephew to allow us to do these things. Questions? Now's the time to talk about extra-articular, what your attendings have, their experience, what they use, um, and quite frankly, extra-articulars, um, now the Lemire is the, the, the one we're using, but some of these other techniques could certainly be utilized. The real question is when to do an extra-articular. Beware of new drugs, implants, and devices which seem to be too good to be true, because they probably are too good to be true. Don't put anything in anybody's body unless you would want it in yours or a family member or friend. As Charles Dickens said, take nothing on its looks, take everything on evidence. There is no better rule. These are some of the devices that are very difficult to remove. I would encourage you when you do your dictations to make sure you uh, say and state exactly what equipment you use because you may not be the person doing the revision, but if you're not, the person who is is going to find you and haunt you to ask you why you did that. 
So these devices I have not personally used, but they're very difficult to get out. There are extraction methods, but you need to get in touch with a company. And then this is another one that's a spiked washer that is very difficult to get out. The pitch of this screw is not like our usual synthes or Zimmer screws. So this pitch can make it difficult where sometime you um, pull the head of the screw off. Another thing that I did during my residency or my fellowship is we did a lot of Gore-Tex ligaments. So the synthetic ligaments or other ways to repair the ACL look very promising. Keep up with those. Um, Martha Murray's bear technique is very promising where hopefully we can repair the ACL. So this is what an x-ray looked like with a Gore-Tex ACL reconstruction. And these did provide stability, but unfortunately all the strands that were in there and the indications were failed open ACL reconstructions. So all these little strands could create a, a sterile synovitis as they failed, or uh, in some cases a um, uh, staph epi aureus uh, infection. So this could be very difficult. So beware of those things that seem too good to be true. These work for a while. The Gore-Tex ligament with all its strands, it worked for a while, but uh, all probably needed to be removed. Any questions? Reflect and uh, get your uh, attendings or those in your conference and what they feel about the newer techniques and advances in instrumentation. Now's the time to share some of these cases, research it, and figure out what you're going to do when you're in practice. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes, Oscar Wilde. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Remember some of these quotes and uh, Understand that you will have complications, there will be challenging times, but be humble and be kind and take care of your patients the way you want to be taken care of. Thank you very much, Waterbuck in Africa. Please uh, go to my website. This will be on the website as will other presentations. And if you would like to reach out to me, contact me, I would be happy to help you in any way.